to another episode of Bergen Stages Radio Theater. Today we bring you a tale of dark secrets and of a dark and secret love. An English classic, Jane Eyre. My name is Jane Eyre. I have no father or mother, brothers or sisters. When I was 10 years old, my aunt sent me off to Lowood School. It was not so much a school as an institution for children of the poor. Soon after I was 18, I placed an advertisement in the Yorkshire Herald, applying for the position of governess. The following week, a reply came from a Mrs. Fairfax of Thornfield Hall in Yorkshire. If J.E., who advertised last Thursday, is qualified to teach the usual branches of a good English education, a situation can be offered her where there is but one pupil, a little girl, nine years of age. Three days later, I left Lowood School, and that evening I was at Thornfield Hall. How do you do, my dear? Oh, I'm afraid you've had a tedious ride. No, indeed, ma'am. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight? I am Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, you mean your pupil, Adele. She is not my daughter. The child is Mr. Rochester's ward. And who is he? The owner of Thornfield Hall. I'm merely the housekeeper. Your pupil is his ward. He wrote me to find a governess for her. He's not here himself? Almost never. Much of the time he's abroad. It does seem strange for a gentleman to own this great house, yet never stop here to enjoy it. You will find, Miss Eyre, that Mr. Rochester is, in many ways, a strange gentleman. I slept smooth and soundly that night in my new home. Once, I woke and heard a clock strike. I heard another sound. It seemed to me that somewhere in the house, I heard a low, mirthless laugh. Then, for many weeks, nothing happened to break the smooth course of our lives at Thornfield Hall. One day in January, I put on my coat and went out for a walk. The afternoon was already dimming, on the hilltop above me sat the rising moon, pale as a cloud. Suddenly, in the distance, I heard the sound of hooves. A horseman came over the hill, down toward the little bridge. Easy! Easy there! <laughs> oh, the devil! Are you injured, sir? Stand on one side. Oh. Down, pilot, down. Oh, my leg. You, uh, where do you come from, you young girl? You're no servant in the hall. I am the governess to Mr. Rochester's ward. Oh, you're the governess. Oh, deuce take it if I hadn't forgotten the governess. Well... Necessity compels me to make you useful. Come close, let me lean on your shoulder. All right. <sighs> Hold the bridle. There we are. <laughs> now just hand me my whip, which lies there under the hood. Here, sir. Thank you. Goodbye, child. As I walked back to Thornfield, I kept seeing his tall figure enveloped in a riding cloak, fur collared and steel clasped, remembering his stern face, his angry, thwarted eyes. It was late when I got back to the hall. <coughs> Mrs. Fairfax? What dog is that? He came with the master. With whom? With the master, Mr. Rochester. He had an accident. His horse fell coming down Hay Lane. He said you were to go to him the minute you came in. Oh. You'd better hurry. Come in. Well, 
Well, sit down, Miss Eyre. You've been resident in my house three months? Yes, sir. You've come from... From Lowood School, sir. Hmm, a charitable concern. How long were you there? Eight years. Eight years? You must be tenacious of life. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marveled where you got that sort of face. I had half a mind just now in Hay Lane to demand whether you bewitched my horse. <laughs> Indeed, I'm not sure yet. Who are your parents? I have none. Never had, I suppose. Don't draw that chair further off, Miss Eyre. Sit down exactly where I placed it, if you please. Otherwise I cannot see you without disturbing my comfortable position, which I have no mind to do. You examine me, Miss Eyre. Do you think me handsome? No, sir. Hmm. What faults do you find with me, pray? Does my forehead not please you? Do Does it look as if I were a fool? Why don't you answer me? You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. You're not pretty any more than I am handsome, and a puzzled air becomes you, so puzzle on. I leave the choice of subjects entirely to you. You're dumb, Miss Eyre, or stubborn. Yes, stubborn and a little annoyed. Confess it, you're afraid of me. I am bewildered. You're afraid. I have no wish to talk nonsense. If you did talk nonsense, it would be in such a grave, quiet manner, I should mistake it for sense. <laughs> Do you never laugh, Miss Eyre? Oh, don't trouble to answer. It's past nine, sir. I must say good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, Miss Eyre. I could not sleep for thinking of Mr. Rochester. I lay there, listening. Then, it seemed my door was touched, as if fingers were groping their way along the panels in the dark gallery outside. Who's there? Who is it? There was a strong smell of burning. Mr. Rochester's door was ajar and smoke rushed from his room. The curtains were on fire. Wake! Wake, Mr. Rochester, wake! Uh, huh? He lay stupefied in his sleep. I rushed to the basin in the pitcher. Uh, oh, what is it? Is there a flood? No, sir, but there's been a fire. On the in, in the name of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jane Eyre? What have you done with me, witch, sorceress? <coughs> this smoke. Who was in the room beside you? Look at me, Jane. D did you... Did you happen to hear, during the night, an odd laugh? Yes, sir. I thought perhaps one of the servants... Oh, just so, one of the servants. You've guessed it. Dan, you're no talking fool. Say nothing about it. What? Are you quitting me already, and in that way... You said I might go, sir. But not without taking leave. Not in that brief, dry fashion. Why, you've saved my life. At least, shake hands. You've saved my life, Jane. I knew you'd do me some good in some way, sometime. Then Mr. Rochester left Thornfield Hall. And when he returned, it was with a large company of very elegant guests. There was one lady in particular to whom my master seemed especially attentive. The Honourable Blanche Ingram, Lord Ingram's sister she is. She's held the most beautiful girl in the county. And this beautiful and accomplished young lady is not... not yet married? It appears not. What is the matter with you, child? You've eaten nothing. What is Jane? What's happened to you? That evening, word came that Mr. Rochester wished to introduce my pupil Adele to the ladies in the drawing room after dinner. I rose and curtsied to them. One or two bent their heads in return. The others only stared at me. As soon as I could, I left quietly through the side door. How do you do? I'm 
very well, sir. Why did you not come over and speak to me in the drawing room, Jane? I did not wish to disturb you. What have you been doing while I was away? Teaching Adele, as usual. Hmm. Getting a good deal paler than you were. Now who in the devil is that at this time of night? Shall I go and see, sir? Yes, Jane. I must return to my guests. I fear Miss Ingram will have marked my absence. Mr. Rochester. Yes? There's a man to see you, sir. He went into the drawing room. The devil he did? Have you his name? Mason, sir. Mason? Yes, sir. I'll see him presently. Yes, Mr. Rochester. Mason? Here? Is that what she said? Do you feel ill, sir? Oh, Jane. Jane, I've got a blow. I've got a blow. Jane, if all the people in that drawing room came in a body and spat at me, what would you do, Jane? I'd turn them out of the room, sir, if I could. But if I were to go into them, and they dropped off and left me one by one, what then? Would you go with them? I rather think not, sir. I should have more pleasure in staying here with you. To comfort me? Yes, sir. To comfort you as well as I could. Much later that night, I wakened suddenly. Jane! Jane! Get up! Get up, I need you! Have you a sponge in your room? Yes, sir. You won't turn sick, Jane, at the sight of blood? Here, give me your hands. Let me see. Warm and steady. You'll do, Jane. Come along. I followed Mr. Rochester to the floor above. We entered a large room, and beyond that, there was an open door, and from inside came a low sound. <sighs> Almost like a dog growling. In a chair was the form of a man, huddled and still. I saw that it was the stranger, Mason, the gentleman who had called earlier. His sleeve and his shirt on one side was soaked with blood. She's done for me! Quiet, Mason. Done for me! Nonsense. You've lost a little blood, that's all. Now then, Jane, hold this basin. Oh, she went at me with her teeth! Will you be silent? She sucked the blood! She said she drained my heart! I warned you, Mason. I thought I could have done her some good. You thought, you thought... Mason, get up! You must be out of this house before morning. Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as I may do be. do my best, Mason. And have done my best, and will do it. Never fear. Yet would to God there was an end to all of this. Mr. Rochester stayed on at Thornfield Hall. The talk continued about his coming marriage to Miss Ingram. Yet never had he called me more frequently to his presence, never had he been kinder to me, and alas, never had I loved him so well. It was a midsummer eve. I went down into the orchard. I heard a nightingale singing in the woods far away. Jane? Good evening, Jane. Thornfield is a pleasant place in the summer, is it not? Yes, sir. Yes. You'd be sorry to leave? Oh, yes. Pity. It's always the way in this life. No sooner have you got settled in a pleasant resting place than a voice calls to you to rise and move on. Must I move on, sir? Must I leave Thornfield? I believe you must, Jane. I'm sorry, Jane, but... I believe indeed you must. You're going to be married, sir. Look at me, Jane. You're not turning your head to look at other nightingales, are you? Adele must go to school, and you, Miss Eyre, will get a new station. Yes, sir. I will advertise immediately. I've heard of a place that I think will suit. A place in Connaught, Ireland. That's a long way off, sir. A long way off from what? 
Jane? I'm from England, from Thornfield, and... Well? From you, sir. Oh, it is. It is, to be sure, it is. A long way off. (laughs) We've been good friends, Jane. Have we not? Come. We'll sit here in peace tonight. And we should never more sit here together. You know, sometimes I have a queer feeling with regard to you, Jane. Especially when you're near to me, as now. It's as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs, tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string suited on the corresponding corner of your little frame. And if that boisterous channel comes broad between us, I'm afraid that cord of communion will be snapped. And then I've had a nervous notion I should take to bleeding inwardly. As for you, you'd forget me. Oh, Jane... I think you'd better stay. Do you think I can stay to become nothing to you? Do you think, because I'm poor, obscure, plain and little, that I'm soulless and heartless? I have as much soul as you, and full as much heart. Jane, be still. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. Don't mock me. I ask you to pass through life at my side, to be my wife. It's you only I intend to marry. Come, Jane. Come here. Your bride stands between us. My bride is here. You strange, you almost unearthly thing. I love you as my own flesh. Come to me, Jane. Come to me entirely now. God pardon me, and men meddle not with me. I have her, and I will hold her. For ye be well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word allow are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Edward Rochester, wilt thou have this woman for thy wedded wife? This marriage cannot go on. I declare the existence of an impediment. Oh, oh my oh. Proceed with the service. Mr. Rochester is wedded wife now, living at Thornfield Hall. I saw her there last April. I am her brother. Oh, my What this man here says is true. Bigamy is an ugly word, yet that is what I am meant to be, a bigamist. I dare say you've heard gossip about the mysterious lunatic kept under watch and ward. I now inform you that she is my wife. Bertha Mason, whom I married 15 years ago. Bertha Mason is insane. You may see for yourself, if you wish, what sort of being I was cheated into marrying and judge whether or not I had a right to break that compact and seek happiness with the girl I love. Well, I failed. Take the coach back to Thornfield. It'll not be wanted today. To the right about every one of you, Away with your congratulations. Who wants them? They're 15 years too late. Next morning at dawn, I made my possessions into a parcel and store from my room. For the last time, I passed Mr. Rochester's door and started down the dark stairs. Jane? Jane? You mean to go one way in the world, and let me go another? I do. You will not stay, Jane? You will not be my comforter, my rescuer? My deep love, my my tragic grief, they're nothing to you? 
God bless you, my dear master. God keep you from harm and wrong. Jane? Jane! <laughs> Jane! A year and a half went by. I wrote to Mrs. Fairfax and begged for news. Three months wore away. Day after day, the post arrived and brought nothing for me. I packed my things and took the stagecoach for the north. Thirty-six hours later, I was at Millcote. Come a long way today, ma'am. We don't get many travellers here these days. I thought perhaps you could tell me, is Mr. Rochester living at Thornfield Hall now? I say, ma'am, don't you know, Thornfield Hall was burnt down. <gasps> Not a stone standing. The fire broke out in the dead of the night. The dead of the night? Was it known how it started? Oh, they guessed, ma'am, they guessed. Uh, there was a woman, would you believe it, a lunatic. But Mr. Rochester? Was he at home when the fire broke out? Uh, yes, indeed, he were. He went up to the tower to get his mad wife out of her cell. She was on the roof. We heard him call her name. We saw him approach her. And then, ma'am, she yelled and gave a spring. And the next minute she lay smashed on the pavement. Dead? Yes, dead as the stones on which her brain and blood were scattered. Oh. But is, is he alive? Y yes, yes, Mr. Rochester's alive, but many think he'd be better off dead. Why? Where is he? Is he in England? Ah, uh, y yes, he is in England. He can't get out of England. I fancy he's a fixture now. He's stone blind, yes. He's stone blind, is Mr. Rochester? I found him in a small manor house nearby. A neglected handful of fire burned low in the grate, and leaning over it, with his head supported against the high, old-fashioned mantelpiece, stood Mr. Rochester. Is that you, Miss Fairfax? Down, pilot. What's the matter? Down. It is you, Miss Fairfax, is it not? Mrs. Fairfax is in the kitchen. Who is this? Answer me. Speak again. Your dog knows me. Mrs. Fairfax. Her very fingers. Her small, slight fingers. If so, there must be more of her. Is it Jane? Well, this is her shape, this is her size. And this her voice. And her heart, too. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. I've now been married ten years. I know what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on earth. Edward Rochester continued blind the first two years of our marriage. Then, one morning, as I was writing a letter for him to his dictation, he came and bent over me. Jane? Jane, have you a glittering ornament around your neck? Yes. And Jane, are you wearing a, a pale blue dress? <laughs> yes. Later, when our firstborn was put into his arms, he could see that the boy had inherited his own eyes, as they once were, laughing, brilliant, and black. Thank you for tuning into Bergen Stage's Radio Theater's production of Jane Eyre, featuring Legionitis as Jane Eyre, Matthew Rella as Rochester, Aaron Ingersoll as Mrs. Fairfax, David Legrand as Mason, Patrick Keistead as the innkeeper, and yours truly as the priest. Thank you to Dean Matson, our recording engineer and sound effects creator, to Burton Community College, the BCC Office of Student Life, and the BCC Media Technologies Department. I am Jim Baumgartner, your host. 
Tune in again to another episode of Bergen Stages Radio Theater soon, and be sure to catch some of our earlier episodes available online. Until next time, remember, don't touch that dial. And if you do, remember to disinfect it first.